My name is Maxine Driscoll. I am the head of PTIS Prem Tinchiland International School and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to our guest speaker series. It's just fabulous to see students, parents, grandparents, board members, founders, visiting schools, schools from the uh, other international schools in Chiang Mai, so many people here wanting to be learners. Thank you for being here. I would like to make a special welcome to the Think Global Schools, the Think Global School, uh, founder and visionary Joanne McPike, uh, Dr. Robert Spellman, the head of school, Dr. Sally Booth, the Director of Curriculum, and all of the teachers and students at TGIS, Think Global School. I'm also very honoured to have our founder, Mom Luong Tree, here uh, as also a visionary and a kind man. We're really thrilled to have Think Global School at PTIS and TriDOT Three Generation Community for Learning. They are the first international travelling boarding school in the world and they're currently studying in their second trimester for the academic year of 2011-2012. They've previously had trimesters in Sydney, Australia, Beijing, China, Cuenca in Ecuador, here in Chiang Mai, Thailand and when they finished here they're heading off to Berlin in Germany. What an amazing experience those students are having. We're very proud to be hosting Think Global School at PTIS and TriDOT Three Generation Community for Learning. TGS are sponsoring Dr. Tony Wagner, so we are all so fortunate to have him come to speak to us. I therefore extend a sincere thank you to Think Global School founder Joanne McPike for making this possible for the Chiang Mai learning community. And I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Robert Spellman, who goes under the name of Bob, is going to come and speak to us. I'd like to thank everyone for coming today, and especially Dr. Wagner for the presentation he's going to give. Since we've been here, head of school Driscoll and I have had only one argument. Uh, we've argued over who has the best job in the world. So I'd like to thank the founders for giving us such a unique discussion to continue why we're here. I'd also like to thank the members of PTIS for the welcoming we have received. It has been marvelous and there's no comparison to it. I get to travel the world with 25 fantastic students, two of which who are from Thailand and one even from Chiang Mai. I also get the opportunity to travel with a talented staff who've left their homes to go on an educational adventure. I'd ask that we remember that besides the staff you see here, we have an incredible group of people around the world who support us in our mission. PTIS is an educational gem, not just for Chiang Mai and for Thailand, but presents a world-class education that we've been honored to be a part of. And we thank you for what you've done for us. And I turn the floor back over to Head of School Driscoll to introduce Dr. Wagner. Many of you know that Dr. Tony Wagner is an internationally renowned educational consultant, Harvard professor and speaker. Dr. Wagner has spent his career researching the most effective educational practices for learning in the 21st century and he's the author of several books. We're not going to go on with his bio because he's so humble, he wants to get out here and start speaking to you and you don't hear all of the wonderful things about him. We're going to hear the wonderful things that he knows. Today's presentation is entitled, Creating Innovators, the Making of Young People Who Will Change the World. And that is the same title of his newest book, which is going to be released in April. So keep your eyes out for that. I'm so excited to see teachers, parents, students, grandparents coming together to learn how we can develop creative innovators for the future. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tony Wagner. Once again, good afternoon and thank you very, very much for coming. 
It's been a wonderful time here in Thailand, in this community, and I am greatly looking forward to this as a conversation, not just as a presentation. So in light of that, what I'm going to try to do is limit my initial remarks to perhaps 35 or 40 minutes. Then I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to talk to each other uh, at your seats and generate questions and comments for discussion that will be the focus of the remainder of the afternoon. Because that is what I will learn the most from, your questions, your concerns, your interests. I'd like to start with this quote from Einstein. The formulation of the problem is often more important than the solution. Too often in education, we have an affliction I call answer-itis. We start with solutions to problems that are not well understood, answers to questions that have not been adequately explored. So from my point of view, this is the essential question we need to be understanding as we move forward as parents, teachers, mentors, and employers. What is the impact of this changing world on education in the 21st century? Now, if I gave us time, I'm sure you could come up with many kinds of impacts. But I want to focus on just a couple for this afternoon. Number one, in the 21st century, knowledge has become a free commodity, like air, like water. And if you think of the vast sweep of history, how we've gone from just a couple of people holding scrolls or clay tablets to then the invention of the printing press, where suddenly people who had money could buy books, not just have clay tablets, to then Andrew Carnegie creating free libraries in the United States, other people doing the same elsewhere, to now suddenly everyone has access to all of the information in the world at their fingertips. Secondly, knowledge is constantly changing. It's not just that it's growing exponentially. What we thought we knew five years ago may no longer be true. How many planets are there today? Are we up one or down one? I haven't checked my internet feed. Is Pluto in the club or out of the club? I'm not sure. Oh, and by the way, that periodic table. How many of you memorized the periodic table for chemistry? Raise your hands. Whatever number you thought there was, two were added last week. Knowledge is constantly changing. The third change or impact that I want to briefly touch on this afternoon is the fact that the students today are digital natives. They've grown up on the internet, as opposed to most of us who are digital immigrants. They are learning things in very different ways. They are differently motivated to learn. So what does that mean? Quite simply, so what, now what? In the 21st century, the world no longer cares what your graduates from your respective schools know. They don't care. That is no value-added capability anymore because that knowledge is free. It's on the internet, the entire MIT curriculum on the internet. There is no advantage to knowing more than the person next to you. You know, if you want to have a little quick contest, see which one of you could recite the 50 capitals of the United States from memory while I Google that fact. Let's see who's quicker. There's no value added to knowing more. What the world cares about is what you can do with what you know. Can you create new knowledge? Can you solve new problems? Can you innovate? And that is a matter of skill and will which demands a very different kind of focus in education for the 21st century. So now let me give you a kind of a story of, of my intellectual journey of the last seven years to try to better understand these problems and what we must do. I decided uh, for my fourth book, some six years ago, that I would do a very different kind of research. I would start talking to senior executives. Given this changing world, given the flat world, what are the most important skills young people need to succeed today in your business, in your community, in your nonprofit organization, in college? What are the skills that matter most? So I took a very wide range of senior executives, literally from Apple to Unilever to the military. I talked to college teachers. I talked to community leaders. I talked to recent graduates themselves, asking them in what ways they felt most and least well prepared. And what stunned me is that in addition to what I would call the habits of the heart, qualities that make us human, our capacity for compassion, 
moral courage, integrity, strong work ethic. In addition to those universal human traits, there's a set of new or quite changed skills around which there was enormous agreement, substantial agreement. I call them the seven survival skills for careers, college, and citizenship. I'll briefly describe them to you and sort of along the way suggest some of the educational challenges these represent for us. Number one, over and over again I heard employers and executives talk about the importance of every single employee being able to think critically and solve problems. The companies or nonprofits that are the leaders in their sector, in their industry, in the world, are those that actively engage the intellectual talents of all of their employees. But it became a little problematic when I asked them, what in fact is critical thinking? What does it mean? Because you know for us it's a buzzword. You know, you ask an educator, like me, what's critical thinking mean? We, we tend to be a little vague. We might say, well, critical thinking means thinking critically. It's kind of a circular thing. We're, we're not accountable for that. So we haven't pushed ourselves to define it. But when I talked to executives and leaders, they were very clear. First and foremost, critical thinking is the ability to ask really good questions, to ask the right questions, to formulate the problem in Einstein's terms. Whereas, as we know, education is much too much about getting the right answers. And the student who has more right answers is considered a better student than one who may have more questions. Collaboration across networks and leading by influence is the second skill. As we all know, increasingly all work is done in teams, and more and more those teams meet and work virtually across the internet. Folks at IBM explained to me that when they have a new customer need or new problem to solve, they pull together teams from all of their different centers around the world so that they can create solutions that are culturally sensitive and specific. But the ways in which those teams are led is profoundly different than it was two decades ago. They're not led by supervisors with positional authority. They're led by peers through influence. Two little problems here. Number one, education is arguably the most isolated profession in modern work life. Most of us as educators, even administrators, work alone all day, every day for most of our careers. How do we, working alone so much of the time, having so rarely experienced real teamwork, how do we teach all young people to be excellent collaborators? How do we model that behavior? And how do we ensure that every student, not just those who've risen to the top of co-curricular activities, but every student learns how to lead peers through influence? Agility and adaptability, the pace of change, the demands for innovation and problem solving absolutely require that employers today that want people to, to be agile, to be adaptable, to be able to respond quickly, pick up a problem, answer a question. In a, in, a, in a thoughtful way. So here's a little, another little problem. You contrast the, the agility and adaptability needed in the modern life with what I would call the regularities of school, except for Think Global perhaps, where this week looks a lot like last week, which looks a lot like last year and a decade ago. Not demanding of students that they be agile and adaptable, quite the contrary. Initiative and entrepreneurialism. Mark Chandler, vice president and general counsel of that multinational corporation, Cisco Systems, talked to me about how senior executives lay awake at night in large companies worrying about how to keep that entrepreneurial spirit and that sense of initiative alive. He said, if I have an employee who sets and meets five goals, 100%, that's no longer good enough. He said, if on the other hand, I have an employee who sets 10 stretch goals and perhaps only succeeds at seven or eight, he or she is a hero. But what would that person be in our schools? Well, if they'd f failed to answer two or three out of 10, they'd be a C or a B student, wouldn't they? I'm gonna come back to this theme of failure in a moment. Effective oral and written communication is the number one complaint of both college teachers and, and employers all over the world with whom I've spoken. Senior executive at Dell said to me, the reason many of these kids cannot write is because they don't know how to think. They don't know how to reason 
They don't know how to analyze. They don't know how to develop a coherent argument. They don't know how to use evidence. And he said that's only half the problem. The other half the problem, in his words, were they don't know how to write with voice, meaning they don't know how to put their own passion and perspective into their communications so as to be truly persuasive. Accessing and analyzing information. We all know, and I've just talked about the fact that information is growing exponentially. It's on every internet-connected device. It's changing constantly. But are we really teaching the skills that students need to give up textbooks? Are we encouraging teachers to give up textbooks and really teach students in classrooms how to do an effective internet search, for example? Curiosity and imagination. Over and over again, I heard executives and leaders talk about the importance of being a lifelong learner, learning how to learn, being curious, being inquisitive. But I have to tell you that a senior a head of one of the most prestigious private schools in the world turned to me once and said, you know, I worry. I worry our kids, the longer our kids are in this excellent K-12 school, the less curious they become. I'll talk a little more about this in a moment. So I put all of this work in my last book, The Global Achievement Gap. It came out in 2008. And as you know, that was also the time in which we began to experience a universal economic meltdown. And that set me on a new course, trying to understand more about economics. I didn't know anything about economics. I am, by the way, a recovering high school English teacher. I knew nothing about economics. Trying to understand, were these skills enough? And I came to understand that increasingly in this new world, the capability that matters even more than these skills is the capacity to innovate, to create something new, to bring that something extra, that spark of something extra to whatever it is you're doing. Young people who can innovate are going to have a rich and satisfying life and interesting and rewarding work. People, young people who cannot innovate may be desperately seeking jobs for much of their lives. So I embarked on a new kind of inquiry, if you will, trying to understand what, in fact, creates a young innovator. So in this case, what I did was start by interv interviewing young people in their 20s who were highly innovative in a variety of ways and in very different kinds of disciplines. Then I went and interviewed their parents, trying to discern if there were any patterns of parenting that seemed to create more innovative young people. Then I asked each young person whom I interviewed, name a teacher or mentor who's really made the greatest difference for you in your work. And every one of them could name at least somebody, not always a teacher, sometimes a mentor out of school. But then I went and interviewed those teachers and mentors. So there's a lot I could share about the book, and we don't have time for all of that. But let me share one finding that was perhaps one of the most startling for me. When I interviewed these teachers and mentors, I discovered that in every single case, each one of them was an outlier in his or her educational setting. An outlier. Oh, never had tenure, taught in ways that were very different than his or her peers. And then when I looked at what made them outliers, I came to understand that in fact, they shared a, a common view of what was their most important work as a teacher. And, and more importantly, what was the kind of culture they were trying to create in their classrooms or work settings. That they had an enormous amount in common. And I came to understand that the culture of schooling, as we find it almost universally around the world, is radically at odds with the culture of learning that develops the capacity to innovate in five essential respects. Number one, we celebrate and reward individual achievement. And of course that's important. But I have to tell you, in the classrooms that develop young innovators, there is much more emphasis put on collaboration and teamwork. More, most of assignments are done collaboratively. 
Number two, we celebrate and reward specialization. The higher up you go in the academic ladder, the more specialized you're supposed to come, become. How do you get tenure? By being very specialized. How do you publish? By being very specialized. We divide and conquer the learning universe into specialized categories called chemistry or physics or history. But not true in the culture that produces innovators. In the culture that produces innovators, the learning is problem-centered, not subject-centered, and young people are pushed across disciplinary boundaries to solve problems. It was a director of talent at Google who said to me, you know, if there's one thing educators could do that would make the greatest difference to prepare young people for workplaces like Google, she told me, is to teach them that problems do not happen within the context of a narrow walls of an academic discipline, and they can't be solved within those walls either. Think um, sustainability as an example. The learning culture, the schooling culture, as we see it in most places, is all about risk avoidance. What's the one thing you don't want as a student? Well, an F. You don't want to fail. You do a lot to fail, to not fail. And so part of what you try to do is you figure out what, what does the teacher want from me in order for me to get the grade that I want. Teachers, by, by historically, our profession has been pretty much risk avoidant. We're not exactly encouraged to do educational research and development, to try out new things. The world that produces innovators is radically different. At IDEO, one of the most innovative companies in the world, they have a motto. They say, fail early and fail often. That is the company's motto. Why? Because there is no such thing as innovation without trial and error. And trial and error is just another set of words for research and development. It's all about making mistakes and learning from mistakes. One of the highly innovative colleges I went to was Oberlin College of Engineering. I talked to a student who said, you know, we don't even talk about failure here. We talk about iteration. What would that be like as an idea in our schools? So while we... Let me just try this idea. How many of you believe you have learned more from your mistakes than your successes in your lives? Raise your hands. How many of you are completely comfortable with students making big mistakes and failing? Raise your hands. It's a little bit of a contradiction in our world here. We try to protect kids from failure. We try to have them avoid risks. And of course, there are lots of risks we do want them to avoid. But how do we teach them? to be responsible risk takers and to learn through trial and error. That's the only way I've come to conclude that students learn resilience and learn self-confidence. It doesn't come, those qualities don't come from risk avoidance. They learn because they come from learning that I can fail and pick myself up and do it again and learn from my mistakes. How do we build that into our education systems? Fundamentally, the learning that I see going on in most classrooms, once you get past the elementary grades, is all about consuming. My job as a student is to consume the information the teacher has given me. But the classrooms that produce innovators are all about creating. In the best schools that I've been in, in every single class, students have to produce real products for a real audience. Finally, and perhaps most importantly and strikingly is in my findings. You know, we rely very extensively on extrinsic motivation for learning. Carrots and sticks, A's and F's. But the world of, of these young innovators is highly intrinsically driven, intrinsically motivated. And then when I went and looked at the patterns of parenting and teaching that developed and reinforced intrinsic motivations, I saw another pattern. Again, completely taking me by surprise. The best t parents of these young innovators actively encouraged more exploratory forms of play. And they valued their students finding and per their children finding and pursuing a passion more than simply getting an academic credential or even getting the highest grades. They understood that once a young person has discovered a passion, they have a reason to persist, to work hard to persevere.
And then what happens is I watch these young people in classrooms where their teachers were also constantly saying, what, what are you passionate about? What do you care about? What do you want to learn? And as these young people pursued their passions, they morphed, they changed, they evolved into a sense of purpose that was more transcendent. Wanting to put a ding in the universe is the way Steve Jobs puts it, or put it. Wanting to make a difference in the world. So, fundamentally then, what I have come to understand is that there is a global achievement gap. And basically that is the gap between what many of our very best schools are teaching and testing versus the new skills all students need for the 21st century. So, much more briefly now, I want to touch on the second point that I mentioned to you at the very beginning. What, in fact, motivates, what are the intrinsic drives and motivations of our digital natives? Well, first and foremost, as you well know, they're tethered to the internet 24-7. They're always connected. But it's what they're doing on the internet that is so different that we need to understand. If we had time, we should ask the young people here. But what I've seen is that they are constantly using the internet to create, to connect, to collaborate. For many of us, it's an information tool. For many young people, it's a tool for learning and self-expression. They're multitasking in a multimedia universe almost everywhere except in school. You know, kids Google stuff for, for fun. Sometimes in American classrooms when I go and observe, I, I rarely see disruptive behavior, but increasingly now I see a couple of students sitting in the back row on their compute phones, their smartphones, Googling what the teacher is talking about to see if it's still true. Number of planets again, remember that? Periodic table? So, let me, before I go to this point here, let me make another point, which is that I am not suggesting that technology is a panacea for the ills of education. In fact, I think it represents a double-edged challenge. On the one hand, we have to bring the best of the new technologies into the classroom. Every student should be taught how to use the internet for effective searches. Every student should be taught how to share work and work collaboratively using these internet tools. But on the other hand, in America today, kids between the ages of 8 and 18 are spending an average of seven hours and 38 minutes on their electronic devices after they've done homework. I worry that we have a generation that does not yet fully know how to not multitask, how to go without their electronic devices. And I deeply believe that we as teachers, mentors, and parents are gonna to have to help them develop the muscles of concentration sustained focus that are absolutely essential for any kind of serious or creative work. Just very briefly, then, this is a generation that on the one hand has less fear and respect for authority, but on the other hand really seeks more authentic relationships with adults. Mentors and coaches who can relate in more authentic ways but not talk down to them or talk at them. Finally, as I explained, this is a generation that really wants and needs to make a difference in the world far more than they want to make money, far more than they want to be famous. They want to make a difference in the world. So let me suggest a few um, implications and then give you some time to talk to one another. We talk about graduating students from our secondary schools college ready. That's become the new mantra in the United States and many other places. The assumption being if only students go to college, everything will be fine and preferably a name brand college. Everything will be more fine if they go to a name brand college. Well, what I've come to understand is that's simply not true. That the real issue is not whether or not our students leave our secondary schools college ready, but rather innovation ready. And that is a very different learning challenge. And the kids who are college ready are not necessarily in any way innovation ready. Having learned to be risk averse, for example, having not learned to collaborate, for example. So what does it mean? We're fundamentally talking about changing the very nature of the education experience. For so many centuries, the education experience has been about knowledge scarcity. How do I as a teacher impart the knowledge my students will need? Because it's scarce. I have it, they don't. I've got the books, they don't. And it's a, it's, it's a kind of focus on passing on the academic content that has stood the test of time. 
Now, let me be very clear. I believe in academic content. You can't teach skills like critical thinking in a vacuum. Content matters as a means to the end of teaching skills. Content matters in and of and for itself. Cultural literacy as an example. But I fundamentally believe we have to change our notions of a knowledge scarcity delivery system to a knowledge glut delivery system where the real competitive advantage, the real challenge is how do we teach students to just in time learning, taking a brand new problem, a new piece of information, new knowledge, and turning it into a new question or a new insight. And that is a very different kind of learning experience where the fundamentally students are creators, not consumers. When it comes down to the classroom, one of the things I like to do is what I call learning walks. I go and observe classes. I've spent two days here, delightful days, observing classes at TG TGS. One thing I frequently like to do is listen for who's asking what kinds of questions. Very often, not necessarily here, but in many places, what I hear are, guess what's on the teacher's mind questions, right? Questions with a right and a wrong answer. And questions where as soon as one student, usually sitting in the front row, has the answer, it's on to the next guess what's on my mind question. Whereas in the very best schools, what, you've, what you hear are very different kinds of questions. I like this, and this is not my work, it's the work of Deborah Meyer. She talks about the importance of developing habits of mind as the new definition of rigor in the 21st century. And habits of mind are really no more than habits of question asking, evidence. What's true, what's not, what's the evidence? Is it persuasive, how do we know? Viewpoints, whose viewpoint are we hearing here? What alternative viewpoints might there be? Thinking about connections, cause and effect. Is there a pattern? Are things connected? Speculating on possibilities, conjecture, what if? And finally, assessing value. Why does this matter? So what? Why is this important? This goes right back to what those executives told me in those interviews five years ago. Asking the right question is the single most important skill they look for in new employees. Today, increasingly, they also say, also the ability to collaborate. So I'm going to conclude with a couple of slides with questions for you, pro apropos of the importance of questions. First of all, questions some parents might ask. To your child, what's your passion? What are you curious about? What do you want to learn? What do you want to know? What do you want to get better at? To your child's teachers, what skills are you teaching? How are you assessing them? Are students creators or consumers in your classroom? To the school, what are you doing to improve instruction continuously? And how do you know it's working? How well are your graduates prepared, really prepared, not just for college in the specific sense, but also for careers and citizenship in the 21st century? So some questions for some educators. I believe in the importance of evidence-driven continuous improvement. And in light of that, the skills, I would, the first question I would ask many of us as educators is what skills are we teaching? How are we assessing them? How much time do our students spend memorizing versus applying and creating in our classrooms? Or am I a better teacher than I was two years ago? What's the evidence? How do I know? What is the school doing to help me cons systematically improve my capabilities as a teacher? Finally, to the school. How well are your students prepared? And how do you know? You know, in so many of these wonderful independent schools, students come in smart and they leave smart. The question is, what is the value we are adding? I'm going to skip these slides for now, if we can get more into them if you want, but what I'd like to do is stop for this moment and give you a chance, three or four minutes, to talk to one another, react, disagree, just, but just talk about your reactions to the presentation thus far and generate some good discussion questions for the remainder of the evening. So take a couple of minutes and talk to each other. I'm going to take a point of privilege here. I'm going to invite the students in the audience to ask the first two or three questions because we don't often get a chance to hear their questions. Yes. About 
That's a wonderful question. I'm going to repeat it briefly, for some of you may not have heard it. She was saying, I think quite correctly, that I was talking about uh, the schools who a have access to the internet and technology, and she was asking, what about the schools and students that don't have that? The so-called digital divide. I think it's an incredibly important point. There's a world of haves and have-nots when it comes to technology. But I also think that divide is closing more quickly than we might imagine. Cell phones in Africa are, uh, and not just Africa, in India and elsewhere, uh, the growth of cell phone use is exponential. And it's giving young people and adults access to knowledge and information that would otherwise be impossible. And we're going to see, I think, in five years, a, a, a time in which the majority of people on the planet will have access to internet and, and information in some way, shape, or form. But I think you, you're raising an implicit question. is What is our responsibility in the meantime to share and to provide? Thank you for that great question. I thought it was really interesting when you were talking about how students these days want close connections with their educators, because that way I personally think you learn a lot more and you want to learn a lot more. But imagine if you didn't go to a school where the classes were smaller and you could make that connection with the teacher. Even with a small classroom, it's, it's difficult to make connections with teachers because maybe your personality doesn't match up with them. I don't have an answer for you. I think that's a really important question. I do know that relationships matter in the classroom enormously. I do know that's a huge strength of Think Global and the connections between students and teachers. Both adults and students have told me that. I talk, I spend a great deal of time talking to educators in the US and elsewhere about breaking down the anonymity of high schools. I think there are ways of ensuring that every single student has at least one adult who knows that student well and who is an advocate for that student, even in the largest schools. So thank you for that excellent comment. Are you suggesting that all schools should go to the culture of integration side? Because you said the student versus something. But then you're giving a lecture, so where are the students? She said, should all schools go from a from a, a culture of consuming to a culture of, of innovation. And, oh, and by the way, she reminds me, in fact, I'm giving a lecture and you all are consuming it, right? Absolutely. There is a time and a place for consumption, acquiring the information you need to be able to do something with it. I watched a model United Nations yesterday, the teacher who's here, uh, had to help students understand what is a resolution, what is a point of order, what is a point of personal privilege. All information they had to have in order to then engage as good model UN participants. He had to give a mini lecture. So I believe there's a time and a place for that. I don't mean to say it's all one or the other. However, and this is a very important however, the only information that is really retained and the only information that really matters is what you can do with it. If he had given that lecture on point of order, point of privilege, and what is a resolution, and then the kids went out the door and didn't do anything with it, I will promise you the retention rate would be 10% 10, 10 at best. And that's too often what we're doing in our classes. I have deliberately set aside time in my presentations and every single presentation I give for two things. Number one, for you to talk to each other. I'm trying to model good learning, so it's not all consumption. You're creating. And number two, for your questions. That for me is an effort, because when you ask a question or when you share a comment with a neighbor, you're creating. You're creating your own thoughts, your own insights. So thank you. Um, when we come up into the DP program, however, we're required to teach that big test. And why do we have to do that is because that's what gets the kids into universities. So what I'm asking you is, have you done this talk with many universities? Because we feel that that's, we're hitting our head against that wall, that we can be using all the best practices and trying to create the innovation, but if it's not going to get into the, the kids into the universities, because universities are not seeing that, are not using those methods, um, how, can this, how can we have that innovation continue into the higher education 
then get into the, um, the workplace. Um, I've got kids that are creating collaborative documents that are live documents that are dealing with content and I have them making notes digitally on their computers but when it comes to the diploma exam at the end of the year I have students who are physically cramping up in their hands because they no longer have the skills to physically write with a pen on paper and so what I'm finding is I'm also having, having to train my students in an archaic form and I might as well be using clay tablets and a stylus in an age where they're accessing electronic digital information and creating collaborative information. The first was to the effect of we appreciate a lot of what I said, I Tony said, but the problem is what about colleges? What are they expecting? How are they doing admissions? And the second comment was a follow-on to that. You know, we're using digital technologies here, but in fact, when students take the IB exams, they have to go back to pencil and paper, and they literally, their hands cramp up because they're not accustomed to that form of test taking. I think both of those questions point to some of the most significant challenges in reinventing education for the 21st century. But there's some good news here. Uh, Bill Fitzsimmons, Dean of Admissions at Harvard, chaired a commission two years ago looking at college entrance requirements. The commission came out strongly urging colleges to radically de-emphasize all uh, standardized test scores in admissions. And in fact, right now today, in the United States alone, you can find more than 750 colleges and universities that don't require any form of standardized testing for admissions purposes. 750, including co selective schools. So there is the beginning of a trend. Will it have change overnight? No, because it involves money. When we start requiring, as I think we must, that all students have digital portfolios that follow them through school, and that college admissions and then employers look at digital portfolios as much better evidence of real proficiency, and that we continue to advocate for that, I think colleges are going to begin to change. I'm already talking to some colleges about that. I have to tell you that one of the biggest surprises in the research I did for my newest book, Creating Innovators, I started the book with the assumption that many of our most widely regarded colleges and universities in the world are in fact hotbeds of innovation. And what I came to discover is that in their admissions policies, in the kinds of teaching they do, they're actually impeding innovation. That's why so many of the most gifted innovators are in fact dropouts. Bill Gates, Michael Dell, Steve Jobs, the list goes on. We are going to have to, as professionals, enter into a very different dialogue about what is college for, what is, what is a better form of college admissions, and it's beginning to happen. Tufts University, highly regarded American University, last year invited students to submit YouTube videos as a part of their application, and they were stunned at the quality and what they learned from those videos, and that it was, in fact, the most informative thing in any student's record. To the second point about forms of testing, it's not just IB, it's so many of these tests, they're obsolete. And, but the good news, again, is that IB leadership is engaged in that conversation. I was invited to the IB headquarters in Washington to give a presentation in December. I've been asked to keynote the IB Americas conference in Cancun, Mexico in July. So I think IB understands the need to begin to make some of these changes, but they need to hear from us as professionals. We need to advocate for the kinds of changes that we believe to be important and not simply be victims of bad forms of testing. We're talking about innovation, but can you see any possible negative effects of changing schools from being primarily textbook-based to being primarily innovation-based? I wouldn't say innovation so much as I'd say technology. The danger is we've become too reliant on technology in our learning, in our classrooms, in our lives, right? We may lose the, the appreciation of text, not textbooks. I've never met a textbook I liked. I never used one as a teacher, but I love text. 
I love to be able to look at text. I love to be able, I have a Kindle, mind you, you know, but I love to be able to look at text, share text, and appreciate a book in my hands. I worry, finally, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, that we, many of us are becoming habituated, if not addicted, to these new technologies. What happens when we hear the ping, you've got mail, right? Oh, oh boy, I just heard from somebody. Maybe it's something interesting. Maybe it's somebody who wants to say something nice to me. It's almost an adrenaline kind of response. In fact, psychologists tell us it is. So I do worry about the impact of all of these things. There's an important book called Last Child in the Woods. Are we raising a generation that doesn't know how to be alone with themselves? Doesn't have experience with a close connection with nature? Wonderful question, Alex. These are the things I worry about. Oh, I'm very much inspired by your talk, and I think you should have a global platform. So are there any plans to get yourself invited onto the TED.com <laughs> stage? <laughs> um, I think your talk could you know, stand up there with the one that was given by Sir Ken Robinson on how schools kill creativity. Thank you. That was a very kind comment. Thank you very much. Um, we'll see what happens with the new book. There's a lot of interest in it. By the way, I have to tell you this, because I'm so excited about this. This new book called Creating Innovators. Well, back up a half a step. Uh, a friend of mine and I, uh, a guy who's a filmmaker, made a uh, documentary with me about Finland's education system, which is, by the way, the best in the world, and which, by the way, does not give any of the kinds of tests we've been talking about. They have a high school matriculation exam. It's the only exam students take in their entire career, and it is all essay-based, and students can choose when they take it, and they can retake it if they're not happy with the results, and they can even choose the subjects that they take it in. Highest performing education system in the world. And by the way, half the students in upper secondary, 45% of the students, choose a career vocational technical education track by choice which leads to good jobs and also forms of post-secondary learning. This idea that, that one size fits all, that everybody ought to have a universal college prep curriculum is belied by the examples of the best education system in the world. But that's an aside. The story is, my friend Bob Compton, who's a filmmaker, said to me, Tony, you can't just write a book about innovation. It has to be innovative. I said, what do you mean? How many of you have heard of QR codes or tags? You've seen these little boxes? Okay. He said, what about embedding these codes all over your book? And I'll make videos about different parts of your book. The interviews with young innovators, uh, interviews with their mentors and parents. So the book which comes out in April has more than 60 QR codes embedded throughout the book, which when you scan with your smartphone will take you straight to a video that Bob Compton has made. Folks, you've been a wonderful audience. You've asked terrific questions. I want to first myself applaud the students for asking great questions and for coming. And I, I finally want to thank our, our co-hosts uh, for this delightful opportunity to share with you this afternoon. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, my name is Joanne McPike and I'm the founder of Think Global School. Um, I'd like to thank you, Tony, for taking the time to come and speak to us. You've given not only your knowledge, but you've given your heart and you know how much that means to me. Uh, you know me so well by now and that you know my heart rules my head. So thank you for being such a good friend and helping me engage my head to make my heart, um, what, what my heart wants come, come true. That's very important. Thank you for caring about our children, for pushing us forward as educators and parents to embrace change. Change is scary. Stepping uh, out of the box is scary. The box is very, very safe. Status quo is very, very safe. So thank you for opening that box up so we can look outside and realize that change is not just scary but very necessary for our children. We as adults, we, we sit inside our safe little boxes um, because it's comfortable for us, but it's not the best thing for our children. Thank you for being the brave one, 
for raising your voice and for taking on the establishment. What we're trying to produce here at TGS are young people who have the courage to take on the establishment, to make change, but not only to have the confidence to speak up, but learn how to do it most effectively, learn how to ask the right questions. One thing we're also doing at TGS is creating friendships, and we're creating memories, and we're creating connections. To me, a global citizen is someone who's able to comfortably connect with other people from all around the world. They're open-minded and they're curious. So I'd like to thank PTIS for hosting us, for opening up their, not just their home, but also their hearts for my students and my teachers. I'd like to thank Momtree, who just had to step out quickly, um, for Maxine, Michael and Linda for everything that you have done, to all of the students at PTIS and all of the parents as well. Your generosity is beyond words and I only hope that we can give back to you by our presence here what you have given to us. Um, a quick thank you to Bob and Sally and Ashley for helping to organize our stay here. Um, to my teachers and to my Res Life staff, I know how hard it is. We spoke about that this afternoon. And thank you to my kids, my amazing students who have left home and are traveling the world, learning as they go. Thank you to Anat, Benny, Karis, and Alex for your questions. That's exactly what we want you to do. We want you to challenge us. I want you to challenge Tony. Never stop asking why. It doesn't matter what anybody tells you. Always ask why. Because we're not always right. Even though we're adults, we think we're right, we're not always right. And you guys come up with some of the best solutions to some of the questions that we're afraid to ask. Uh, thank you very much for those amazing questions about the universities uh, not accepting or changing their standards. Uh, that's one of my next missions, so stay tuned. That, that's my next crusade. Thank you all very much for coming this evening. Thank you.